And so maybe to, to get the sort of the feeling part mm. that I was so hungry for, this relationship with Jesus that evangelicals talk about, I had to actually, I had to actually take that step. And so, you know, I took a lot of comfort in Romans 10, 9, uh, that, you know, if you believe with your heart that uh, Jesus, um, uh, what is it, died for our sins and, and confess with your mouth yeah. that he rose, that God yeah. raised him from the dead, yeah. you will be saved. Um, yeah. That that that's like the core. Mm. And and that I could I could agree to sort of struggle with all the other pieces mm. and, and all the other doubts that are absolutely still persistent and and that 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 is the core. And so I yeah, I found myself confessing that, you know, oh. in, in this in JD's office. Hello and welcome to Reenchanting, the podcast from Seen and Unseen. I'm Justin Briley. And I'm Val Tindall. And we talk to interesting people on this show, both with and without faith, about the way in which the Christian story has shaped our world and whether a secular post-Christian world can be re-enchanted with the wonder and mystery of that story again. Do please like, share, comment and leave a review of the show, whether you're listening on podcast, watching via video. It all helps other people to discover re-enchanting. And today we are so honoured, overjoyed, uh, to be joined by Molly. Molly Worthen is a journalist and an Associate Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And for the past decade, she has pursued a career research in the religious and intellectual history of North America, and as well as writing books such as Apostles of Reason, The Crisis of Authority in American Evangelicalism. She's also a regular contributor for publications such as The New York Times, The Atlantic and The New Yorker. But Molly's uh, story took an interesting turn recently. Having been an agnostic for most of her life, last year she converted to Christianity. Now, having researched the bad, the good and the ugly of Christian history, we're going to be finding out what led Molly to embrace faith in the end. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the continuing polarization of politics and church culture in the US, why on earth has Molly chosen to be an insider rather than an outsider mm -hmm. in the US church? Uh, so welcome along to the show, Molly. Thank you for having me. So excited. I'm so excited about so many parts of this conversation. Uh, but before we get into any of that, our first question is always the same uh, in Reenchanting, as our listeners will know well by now. Uh, we are sat on the top of Lambeth Palace Library. With the doors open today, hence some of the background noise, because it's a yes. hot summer's day that we're recording. It's on. a hot summer's day and we're essentially in a glass house on a roof. <laughs> so you do have the soundtrack of London. But... Um, we're in a library, so our first question is always, what are you reading at the moment? What's sat on your bedside table? It's kind of a big stack. You never know yeah. what mood you're going to be in. Mm -hmm. I've got, uh, close to the top, I'm, I've got a, a volume by the 17th century English Puritan John Owen on mm. sin and temptation. I'm also making my way through a compilation by a Russian abbot named uh, Iguman Haritan called The Art of Prayer, mm. all about uh, Eastern Orthodox approaches to prayer. And then for bouts of insomnia, I love polar <laughs> exploration. And um, I've go always got one of those going. So I'm reading the memoir of Captain Robert Bartlett, who was captain on the Canadian Arctic Expe Expedition of mm. 1913 to 1916. Uh, the voyage of the Carluck, the last voyage. It was didn't end well, got frozen in very quickly, um, and they drifted toward Wrangell Island. It's an amazing story. Um, but I'm an enormous physical coward myself. <laughs> so I I love reading yes. yeah. these amazing stories. But of, not being part of exactly. it yourself. Yes. And there's something about reading it at 2 a.m., with, I suddenly feel so, so cozy. Yeah. I feel so cozy. Yeah. So, you know, reading about their, you know, misery on the ice <laughs> helps me fall back asleep. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely the same, but with like the ocean, I am way too much of a coward to ever venture into it and explore its depths. So reading about it is the perfect escape. Mm. You can do it with a smugness knowing I'll never do that. Uh, I'm, <laughs> exactly. I'm sure there's a few books. We're, we're, we're literally, you know, sitting on top of a huge library and archive of ecclesiological literature from centuries past. There's probably a few books in in here you'd like to get your hands on as a church historian. Oh, man. You? Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> I would love it. We, we'll give you the tour 
after the mm. after the recording. But what what does um, life look like for you as a professor of history? You're at the University of North Carolina. What what's kind of your average day there? I guess it depends on the time of year. So mm. in the summer, in, in principle, I get to work a little bit on my my own research. During term time, an average day is if I'm teaching, scrambling to make last minute revisions mm. on whatever lecture I'm giving that day. This past year was a little more interesting than usual. I was doing a lot of team teaching with colleagues in very different disciplines. So I taught a big course called Humans and the Cosmos oh, wow. with a colleague who's a physicist and then another guy who does German philosophy and literature. So what this entailed was a lot of kind of revisiting history that maybe I teach in other contexts, but having to draw new connections to the history of physics, yeah. to you know the whole trajectory of philosophy from the pre-Socratics on. We were throwing a lot at our first mm. year students, so mm. that was. A and lot and of I guess you learned a lot in the process of researching all of that to to create those courses. Yes, I learned a lot more about the history of science, yeah. uh, and it. I mean, the course was meant as a way of of saying essentially to students. Here are three very dis different disciplines, but we are all grappling in our yeah. own ways with mm. the big, mm. the giant questions, mm. you know, the origin of the universe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The ulti what's the ultimate stuff we're made of? Um, and, and so it, it, was, it was really nice to be forced to step back mm. and reflect on those bigger metaphysical questions, which often get pushed to the side in an ordinary history yeah. class. Yeah. And speaking of that, your specialism is Northern American religious history. Uh, you, how did you get into that? Because that didn't come from a personal place in that it's not because you were born into that kind of context. So where did that fascination come from? That's exactly right. I grew up outside of Chicago and a totally secular family. Mm. And when I got to university, to, in the course of taking classes in history and, and politics, I began to realize that for the vast majority of human beings over the course of our existence as a species, religion was a, an enormously important framework. And mm. if I wanted to understand the history and the literature I was reading, I had to learn more about religion. I think too, I started to meet classmates who came out of um, you know, some sort of intense uh, community, mm. uh, often religious. And I was, I was envious of that. I, I was envious of people who had a whole set of resources to turn to for the big questions mm. to avoid having to stare into oblivion. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't know how, how to get to that because my whole sort of, you know, path of, of approach was secular, but I was kind of, I was interested in sidling up alongside it by reading a lot. Mm. My first love was actually Eastern Orthodox Christianity, mm. just because I stumbled into a class on Russian history. Mm. My father gave me a bunch of Soviet propaganda posters to decorate my dorm room <laughs> one year. So they were completely cool normal. Yes. Completely normal. That's <laughs> what sort of how my family is. And I thought, well, gosh, I ought to actually ought to learn about what, what these, these posters, posters are and what the context is. So I took a lot of Russian language and Russian history. I spent a summer in uh, rural north central Alberta studying a community of Russian Orthodox old believers oh. uh, who ha you know, had been persecuted first mm. by the czars and then the communists yeah. and the diaspora is all over. And, and they preserve a lot of uh, very traditional ways of life and, and very serious purity rules. And that was my first taste of what it's mm. like to really try to occupy the worldview of someone quite different from you. I, I made friends with some of the young women in the community and kind of gradually won enough trust to be invited to help slaughter chickens and, you know, attend sewing parties to prepare for weddings and things like this. Um, and I, I think I was attracted to the, the total alienness mm. of Eastern Orthodox um, culture and, and thought. You know, there's, there's just, there's no, there, all of the anxieties that one encounters in Western Christianity about faith and reason, mm. free will, these, it, it's not quite right to say they don't exist in, in Eastern Christianity, but they have so much less importance. And mm. I think I sensed this challenge to my own paradigm. I had a few detours. I got very interested in journalism and kind of realized by the end of university and uh, that I wanted to be a religion writer. But I thought, well, you know, I have to think practically. I probably can't sell too many newspaper editors <laughs> on articles about Eastern Orthodox monks. <laughs> so maybe I should learn something about, you know, the, the current scene. Mm. I didn't, when I began graduate school, I didn't know 
anything really about American right. religion. I mean, I couldn't have told you the difference between a Baptist and a Methodist. Right. Uh, well, okay. But I went to graduate school thinking I'm doing this not to become a traditional academic, but to fill the well. So yeah. I, I yeah. have something to say about, mm. you know, mm. the current the current culture wars. And 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 I ended up I freelanced alongside my graduate work. In the meanwhile, the economic bottom really fell out from journalism as a mm -hmm, profession, mm -hmm, even more so mm -hmm. than the humanities and academia, which is saying something. I was going to say, it comes to something when academia is your backup option. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. And I, I got spoiled by the luxuries of mm. studying religion, and including doing yes. journalistic work from a perch in a university and was mm. lucky enough to... To, to get a job that allows me to to do that full time while also doing as much journalism as I can. And, and you were approaching this sort of as an in, interested agnostic, effectively, in, at a personal level. Was that kind of where you would have described yourself? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I considered myself open to the claims mm -hmm. of religion. I made a couple of incompetent attempts to get myself churched. Okay. over over college and, and graduate school, the most prominent of which was about halfway through graduate school. I was attending, just as a sort of back of the church observer, the, um, the high Anglo-Catholic Episcopalian parish mm -hmm. and felt pushed at a certain point to, to be able to participate, not even able to say at that point that I was a, a theist, let alone right. could get on board with all the Jesus stuff. Yeah. But I just thought, well... You know, may, maybe if I maybe if I just trust this feeling and, and move with this, maybe there's something to these and, sort and, of higher sacramental and theologies. At, at that point, your research into the history of the church and so on hadn't sort of put you off the whole thing. I mean, what what was kind of the the research you were doing kind of make you feel about this institution, the church? That's interesting. I I suppose the the whole way along, you know, slowly learning to be a historian, really starting as an undergraduate, uh, you you can't. You can't hold on to any romantic notions about human institutions mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. very long. So I'm not that impressed by the various horrors and hypocrisies that, you know, saturate Christian That's history. Interesting. Yeah. I I suppose the the one doctrine, you know, who was a G.K. Chesterton, you know, said that the one empirically demonstrable Christian doctrine is the doctrine of original sin. <laughs> and I was always yes. persuaded of that, mm. uh, that kind of fundamental depravity. And certainly, I mean, maybe it was helpful that my road into religious history was a path through Russian and Soviet history, mm. because if you have any inclination to blame you know, re religious ideologies for m more of the mass murder and, you know, terrible mm. things that humans do to each other than non-religious ideologies. Russian and Soviet history very quickly disabuse you of that, that yes. notion. Mm, yes. It's just how humans are. Uh, so, and I was always just very focused on, on the ideas and the, and the, the alienness of the worship experience. And I think I, I have always had that luxury because I'm an outsider, mm -hmm. because I didn't grow up in it. Mm. And I don't have a, a childhood of, you know, sort of bullying pastors or, you know, toxic uh, <laughs> congregations that all these terrible stories you that I've You didn't have heard. all that baggage to I, kind of I put didn't. you in off it. Right. right. Now, yeah. I, I had a lot of hostility to organized religion when I was okay. young. And I, I can't tell you where it came from. I, it was just somehow I perceived, you know, when our lovely Presbyterian neighbors invited us to go to church with them for like the 10th time. And so my <laughs> parents finally went. My parents were not interested, but they wanted to be polite. I just remember kind of seething in, you know, right. while the, the lovely hymns were going on, just feeling yeah. that this was this great imposition on me. Um, or when my, my mother, it just purely out of a desire to help my brother and I become, you know, educated participants in Western civilization, tried to read us some of the more, you know, innocuous and exciting Bible stories. I, I mean, I, I held my ears. I just, I, yeah. I perceived it as this thing being imposed right. on me and yeah. I can't, I can't explain where that came and, and from. It, yeah. It's not that you'd been sort of brought up by a Richard Dawkins type anti-religious sort of environment. No. You were just somehow didn't didn't want to hear about it. Right. right. But by by the time I was a young adult, I, I was in this this fumbling place yes. of, of seeking and trying mm. to mm. trying to get there. And so I ended up getting baptized at this Episcopalian church. I, I you know, the, the rector who guided me through it, I think he was very used to people in my category. You know, we, we had a very 
open-ended conversation about how uh, I could think of the creed in aspirational terms. Yeah. I think he didn't he didn't hold my feet to the fire at all, and I, I think ultimately that was that didn't serve me well. Um, and so I went to church, you know, for a short period, but kind of fell away. And then mm. I think for many years I was in a place of well, eventually I, I guess I was a dissatisfied agnostic. Okay, just mm -hmm. thought eventually mm -hmm. I'll get myself in order, I'd become Catholic or something <laughs> respectable, <laughs> but, proper. but it's like, it's not urgent. And, mm. you know, I, I, I took refuge in a great deal of snobbery about liturgy. So we moved to North Carolina, but more than 10 years ago to take our jobs at uh, the university of North Carolina. And I thought of myself, you know, if I go to church as, uh, you know, this opinionated agnostic that I am, it's only going to be, you know, Westminster Abbey or like a, a lovely, you know, sort of yeah. parish church in the English yeah. countryside, which you can find an approximation of if you're in the Northeast yeah. or in Toronto okay. where we spend some time, yeah. not in North Carolina. <laughs> and so I use that as an excuse to really kind of put it all mm. in a box. And my my intellectual hero was, and I think, to some extent really remains the philosopher William James, whose whole pragmatist philosophy is premised mm. on, in principle anyway, holding your presuppositions lightly mm. Mm. and being open to new evidence that might challenge you and accepting that absolute truth is this asymptote that we can never fully okay. possess, but mm. we can kind of inch our way toward. Yeah. So I thought, I thought that's what I was doing. Okay. Mm. So is that... So as a child, covering your ears to as a young adult, just being curious and sort of edging towards and now where are you at and how have you got there? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. You met. Well, I'll Buckle just start, yeah. I'll start rambling. You can kind of redirect <laughs> me if I get off in, in a rabbit trail. I have so I you know continued to do my journalism alongside my teaching and research at UNC. And so last spring. I was working on a magazine article about a local Southern Baptist megachurch and the pastor who uh, who's kind of grown it from a, a, a small, uh, quite, quite ordinary Baptist mm. church into this huge phenomenon that's quite an influential internationally oh, okay. in the past 20 years. The church is called the Summit Church based in Raleigh. The pastor is J.D. Greer. And I, I had been doing my usual, you know, journalistic stuff. Uh, interviewing uh, staff uh, at the church, becoming increasingly struck by how even by the standards of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is a denomination that puts a pretty high priority on evangelism, this church was really mm. unique. I mean, it, it has for the past uh, over 10 years sent out the most missionaries worldwide of any church in right. that denomination. Mm. Uh, it has planted over 500 new congregations wow. all Gosh. around the world it's practically a denomination in it itself is, wow. yeah <laughs> which is sort of a phenomenon yeah. that, you know yeah. so this is a pattern in american yeah. evangelicalism these okay. these big very entrepreneurial mega churches which then kind of spawn yes. baby churches right. yeah. and they have their own conferences and, and, and jd sort of greer if i'm right was also the the head of the southern baptist convention yes. at one time yeah so he had he had just stepped down mm. uh, at this time but he he was the head of the southern baptist convention during a, a, a unusually rocky period, right. both because of um, the uh, de developments in the um, revelations about uh, mishandling of sexual assault allegations, mm -hmm. as well okay. as COVID. So right. he'd been dealing yeah. with all of that, and he mm. just he just stepped down. I finally got to interview him in March of last year, and it was a really interesting conversation. The follow-up, he, he emailed me afterward, and we had a kind of nice follow-up correspondence that turned into an email conversation about Jesus and the historical evidence for the gospel <laughs> narratives. And I realized as these emails were going back and forth that he, I was being evangelized. <laughs> oh, he's very good at his job. And, <laughs> but it's odd to say, I mean, I've, I've, I'd spent by this point, you know, 15 plus years talking and spending a lot of time with uh, evangelistically minded Christians mm. and occasionally at the end of an interview or something they might ask me what my own views were and I would always be honest and mm. say I'm a I guess I'm a seeker although I hate that word I'm agnostic and the most they might say would be well I I'll pray for you but I think there is a real stigma attached to evangelism and I understand mm. it I mean in our pluralistic 
society evangelism is sort of outrageous yes mm -hmm. right like what the premise of it we all our our modern pluralistic democracy depends on all of us kind of holding our mm -hmm. if we have an exclusive truth claim we have to sort of hold it hold very that. close to yeah. our chest and yeah. Yeah. and live in this cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. where we don't you know we don't constantly confront our neighbors with it yeah on the other hand if you really believe this stuff i've always thought i've always had a lot of respect mm -hmm. for for missionaries yeah. and people who do you know share whatever their their gospel is and that was the case here and as it unfolded i realized that i had i guess a lot of questions bottled up that i hadn't even risen to the surface i had been reading in the months prior to this cs lewis's space trilogy hmm. um, which i had picked up just out of a sense of professional duty, not a sci-fi person. <laughs> I like C.S. Lewis as much as the next person, but I wasn't sort of yeah. obsessed with him. Yeah. Um, but that trilogy, so, you know, this is um, uh, the Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and that hideous strength. Mm. I mean, without going into the, the uh, crazy details that <laughs> won't translate in summary, you just have to read the books, I think. They prompted me to really think about original sin and supernatural presences mm -hmm. and then also i mean part of what lewis is doing in that trilogy is a real uh, a, a searing criticism of secular academia essentially and he yeah. was he was talking about you know oxford and yeah. cambridge in the 1940s but so much of what he has to say in that yeah, it's still, is, still still so true it's it not more so is. Yeah, yeah. yes and i think i was at a place where i was i was no longer satisfied with the, the, the worldview that I thought was my own. And I was beginning to, I, I was more open, I think, to, mm. the, to the Christian line of critique that says secular liberals borrow a lot of their presuppositions, you know, by which they get to moral mm. universals and, mm -hmm. uh, and the golden rule and all these things. They borrow those from the Judeo-Christian legacy. I was more open to that line of thinking. Yeah, so it sounds like there were a few different sort of intellectual issues going on there you were asking about sort of the the nature of morality and and the kind of evil that seems to be so prevalent under the surface in our culture and then you're having this kind of question sort of conversation with JD about the uh, biblical reliability and that kind of thing uh, I mean I'm guessing a lot of these weren't exactly completely new to you some of these conversations but but did your thinking start to change as you were having those conversations well here was the big intervention that i i only see in in retrospect mm. i wasn't seeking out if you are if you're sincerely looking at converting i think to any of the world religions but certainly christianity and as a, a fully formed you know thinking person it's a lot of crazy stuff to take on at once, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, it's so it's all the Jesus stuff. It's pretty, mm. pretty nuts. There's a lot, you know. the The whole Bible is full of of the things that are very hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, you know, there's heaven and hell, the end times. You know, there's the sexual ethic that is totally at odds with modern secular liberal culture. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an awful lot, and it. I think I was paralyzed. I didn't know. How do I get in, right? I mean, if I would maybe begin to investigate one piece of it, and then I would start to remember, wait, but there's all the other bananas <laughs> stuff. I, how can I even be taking this seriously? I can't, I can't go any further. And what JD helped me see was that Christianity is, is a bit unique in really it stands or falls on this single claim about this thing that Christians say happened in history. Mm -hmm. And that is that the tomb was empty yeah. and that Jesus rose from the dead. And on top of that, it turns out that there is a lot more quite, quite interesting, provocative and compelling historical evidence around, you know, that set of events mm. than I had realized really to my embarrassment. I mean, I, I'm a historian of Christianity, not of the first century period, but I'm a historian of Christianity. And I think I had somehow just absorbed from the ether, the sort of mid 20th century uh, Jesus seminar, sort of New Testament uh, 
criticism view that, well, it's sort of all it's all a bit fuzzy. very yeah. fuzzy. Mm. It's kind of like a game of telephone. Mm-hmm. Who knows what happened? You know, there's this like core Jesus we can't access and then the accretions of all the supernatural stuff. But I'd never really done my homework. So I said to JD, because he would he would come back. I would I would throw these questions at him, which I'm sure he'd heard a million times. But he took them all incredibly seriously. And he said to me at one point, Molly, God will not honor any conversion unless you are you are totally investigating this intellectually. Like you cannot turn your brain off. Mm. And That's I thought, wow, that, yeah. I really needed to hear that. Mm. And I said, well, I, I you know, I, I like to read stuff. I like homework. Just give me homework. And and so he uh, reconnoitered with some other uh, theologian colleagues. Uh, he he told me that he asked Tim Keller, the pastor who who died recently mm. in New York, about sort of my case, which. That was this was very sort of strategically. He took cluttered. it straight to the top. He basically. did, and it was very. <laughs> I mean, very... It sounds like you were being treated as a very special case. Well, here, and so this was very clever, <laughs> right? Because it's very flattering. So I was like, oh, these fancy pastors are interested mm. in my case. I guess I need to sort of let this play out. And I began to get kind of excited because I'd always sort of wanted mm. to be a Christian. I just didn't think it was. I always thought, wouldn't it be great if it's true? Too right. bad it's probably not true. Mm. But I had not actually looked at the evidence. So he came back with a reading list for me. Prominent on uh, this reading list was N.T. Wright's giant book on the resurrection, The Resurrection and the Son of God, yeah. Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So a number of very smart Anglicans. Mm. Again, he knew, he sensed correctly, <laughs> like even though I'm a scholar of American evangelicalism, I think I write pretty sympathetically about, about American evangelicals, he sensed the sort of intellectual snobbery, like the way the way to win this gal over is not by recommending like a bunch of Southern Baptists. I need to go to the British <laughs> Anglicans <laughs> because she's clearly Anglophilic. There's like this Anglo-Catholic thing happening in her history. It's very smart. Mm. And I so I began reading these books alongside more popular apologetics. I read mm. a lot of Tim Keller mm. yeah. and often I would get kind of lost in the weeds of of. Uh, Tom Wright's book, which I love. It was the crucial intervention for me, but it is an intense 800 Chunky. page. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't call it a romp, right? <laughs> like, no. It's like you're, so there would be moments where I would say, well, wait, why am I sort of so far in the weeds on first century Jewish attitudes toward you yeah. know, this or that piece of, of, of the afterlife? And I would go back and read Tim Keller's a chapter in his book, The Reason for God, his chapter on the resurrection to sort of regain my mm. perspective. Mm. This whole time I was having to take pretty intense notes and found myself keeping a journal, which I'm not, I'm not inclined to do ordinarily, but I had to keep recording my reactions to what I was reading. You know, N.T. Wright walks you through, you know, first century uh, Greek and, and Roman and and, um, and Jewish views of the afterlife and resurrection, and builds the case that mm. uh, what the the first Christians said happened to Jesus is mm. not at all something that they had pre-existing mm. historical or cultural categories for. Uh, ri- rising from the dead and appearing to disciples was not something that first century self-proclaimed messiahs were in the habit of doing. And while uh, in isolation, either the empty tomb or the reports of his appearances would not be by themselves a persuasive case for the resurrection of Jesus, that in combination and in that very particular finely grained cultural context, there is a compelling Mm. case to take it seriously. Because this would be a very odd story for people from that time and age and culture Mm. to make up to try and persuade exactly. people in a sense there's a sort of i don't know whether i've heard of historians talk about a criterion of embarrassment that if something is a really odd thing for someone to mm. to, to be saying at the time it, it's more likely to be true because it it's it, it's not the kind of thing you would you would make up to make your case look better uh, mm. it, it, to a lot of people as, as paul says it was foolishness to the gentiles this whole idea of a, a messiah who you know came was crucified and and raised again in that sense. That's exactly right. And I was alongside this reading. I mean, I was digging into academic journals, you know, using the databases I have access to as a history professor to read the, the back and forth among scholars on uh, 
Tom Wright's book and on kind of the larger question of, of historical evidence for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I came away from reading through those debates with the sense that here, here is an extreme example of what is perhaps a pattern that you could see in any historical debate of, of, of real importance. And that is that both sides are deeply informed by and bound to their pre-existing commitments and presuppositions. And that those who were just unwilling to permit uh, the possibility of any kind of supernatural action would find ways to explain away any mm. of the evidence that was inconvenient. And then the, you know, the reverse is certainly true for the other side. And I mm. found myself sort of stymied and, and at the point where I thought, well, my, what, is, what is really preventing me from engaging this evidence is my own commitment to materialism mm. and my own deep epistemological groove uh, but if I'm willing to suspend that, what happens? Because we think about the historical method. The historical method is premised on our ability to draw analogies between our own lived experience of mm -hmm. the laws of nature, cause and effect, and how they worked in the past. And if we define a miracle as God's intervention in, manipulation of, or, or suspension of those relationships of contingency, then yes, of course, mm. at the singularity of the miracle, the historical method breaks down. So you can't prove mm. the mm -hmm. resurrection. Yeah. And you know, none, of, none of these apologists would say that you can prove it. However, I, all of the stuff around it, you know, the, the accounts we have of the, of the disciples' experiences, mm -hmm. the, the, the record of the text and the ways we can you know, evaluate the reliability of the text, all of those features of the story are susceptible to the tools of the historical method. Mm. And so you can walk right mm. up to it and get to the point where you're still faced with a leap of faith, but it's no longer a 10 mm. mile leap <laughs> yeah. you know, into the dark. It's a leap based on a pretty reasonable body of evidence. Mm. And it turns out that to, to reject that leap is, is itself an act of faith. And this is something I think I'd always appreciated intellectually that no matter what your worldview is, if you're an atheist materialist or a Buddhist or a Christian, whatever, at bottom, your worldview is based on some set of unprovable foundational mm -hmm. assumptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But even though I'd paid kind of lip service to that, I hadn't, I hadn't really grappled okay. with how that was true for myself and faced what might happen if I allowed if i kind of followed my pragmatist hero william james to the point of saying what if my presuppositions are incorrect mm, yeah so this is your intellect is very much leading the way and i love that because it can and i think that's a huge myth around christianity that you kind of have to park that but so as all of these all of this evidence is coming and you're reading and all of these sort of boxes are being ticked and all of this is there anything happening emotionally or i think I don't know if I want to say emotionally, but you know, emotionally, spiritually, is there something that you're feeling grown within you that you can't sort of define that felt unfamiliar or familiar? Yes, I, I love that question. I mean, my I think my whole career, I've been very envious of the born again experience. <laughs> okay. Like, wouldn't that be awesome to have yeah. like a totally, you know, like a caricature born again experience where it's just all the sudden lightning bolt, <laughs> yeah. all your doubts disappear. I mean, increasingly, I don't think that's how it works for um, almost anyone. I wish. So, but I was, I was thinking this whole time, like I'm, so I'm, I'm taking all these notes, making my way through all these footnotes. I'm thinking I, I can't just kind of reason my way to faith. Something else mm. has to happen. Now, don't get the impression that like all I was doing was you know checking books out of the library and avoiding sort of the obvious things, which are like the Bible <laughs> and <laughs> prayer and going to church. Yeah. So I was reading scripture, the reading through the gospels again and again, which I had, I mean, I was someone who, because of my profession, I read scripture a fair amount, but always out of a sense of duty, not really with any emotional connection. Mm. I was finding at this time that I was having a, a different kind of response mm. to to the Gospels, uh, especially the Gospel of Mark. Uh, first, in an intellectual way, um, and this is something C.S. Lewis says, right? That you know he he spent his career reading the mythological and literary traditions, you know, across across a wide range mm. of cultures, 
and the gospels are something different in in their genre right yeah. so in reading them especially mark who's so gritty mm-hmm. right there's just the sense that you're you're getting it as it as it really was yeah. there's so many weird details mm-hmm. i i found myself mm-hmm. thinking this just reads like stuff that happened and i was having particular reactions to some of the accounts of miraculous healings you know in mark 7 mark 8 you know where he you know he'll take a, a blind jesus will take a blind man you know, off to the side and, you know, spit on his hands and do this, you know, very particular, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, rubbing mud on him and so forth. Or, you know, the, the, the blind man who initially doesn't see completely, but, you know, sees people who look like trees walking. They're both so strange. And a bit gross. And a bit gross. (laughs) Yeah. But there's this way in which Jesus is meeting each person as he or she is in a very particular individualistic way mm. that I just found my, I found myself sort of magnetized mm. by, by this. All this time I was also continuing to attend worship at this mega church. So I had tried my hardest to <laughs> hold the evangelistic stuff that was happening with this pastor I was writing about at bay mm. until I could get the article done, right? Because mm. it's a little bit weird mm. to be trying to, you know, be the, yes. the sort of professional yeah. journalist. It, it's, it's a strange kind of confluence yeah. of your personal life meeting this professional right. job that you've been employed to do. Right. So, I mean, that was part of the reason for the journal because I felt I, I can't, I'm still writing about this church and, and JD, I can't be, you know, going to his <laughs> office hours and pouring my soul out. I've got to keep it in the journal. <laughs> but I finished that article and I continued to attend his church to my shock because i was this giant high church snob mm. who you know i sort of appreciated mega churches from an anthropological point of view yeah. but you know there, where's the yeah, incense yeah. and the choir right and this is i mean summit is you know if just imagine your platonic ideal of a suburban american <laughs> mega church just <laughs> huge i mean and i attended so it, it's one of these churches that has multiple campuses i mean now i think it has 14 mm. at mm. the time it had 12 i attended the mothership so, you know, it looks like a, a big box yeah. store, right? It does not look like a church from the outside. Giant parking lot, big auditorium with relatively comfy seats, mm. really awesome professional, mm-hmm. you know, rock band essentially yeah. leading mm-hmm. worship. Uh, hardcore 40 minute sermon of just absolute Calvinist seriousness. <laughs> so, that I think is one major misconception that people mm. have about mega churches. There's a lot of theological diversity. Sure. This is a very reformed church. But it's not all Joel Osteen, live your best life no, now type No, this of is the opposite, theology. opposite right. end of okay. the theological spectrum. And I, I think kind of in, in mulling over, like, why am I, why am I magnetized to this church that I've always been, I've always really held myself mm. aloof mm. from suddenly? I think there were a couple of things. I mean, one, successful evangelism always happens in the context of, relationships friendships Mm -hmm. and so it's really important that i was becoming friends with this pastor and we could this is crucial as much as we would be having these kind of serious conversations about my various objections to you know this or that piece of the christian argument we were constantly teasing each other and kind of stepping back from Mm -hmm. the situation Mm -hmm. and laughing about Mm -hmm. how because it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. the the dynamic in an evangelistic conversation is <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, right? And if you can't laugh about it together, yeah. I think it's it's doomed. Uh, so I had this combination as I was going to this mega church of really comfortable anonymity. Like I could go and it's dark. It's hundreds of people. <laughs> no one knows who I am. It's so loud. I can't even hear my own <laughs> self singing, which is yeah. a blessing because I'm so tone deaf. <laughs> And I can just sort of be there and absorb it. I was sitting way like the nosebleeds, mm. like way in the back. But then, you know, if I was feeling brave, I could go down and, and talk to this pastor who I was getting to know. And I think, too, in mulling over uh, the power of that worship for me, I, as a historian, when I would go to more high church, elaborate uh, liturgy, which I still love, I think it was giving my mind all kinds of excuses to, to see and think about lots of stuff that wasn't Jesus. That's really interesting. So like it was too fascinating. Yeah, because <laughs> I would just, point of view. I would just go to, you know, Anglo-Catholic worship and just, you know, think about, you know, the different versions of the Book of Common Prayer yeah. and, and, you know, the, just the civilization, uh, you know, on display here and not the guy on the crucifix. Now, there's no mm. crucifix at Summit. Mm. They're one of mm. these very bare bone mm. churches. Mm. But mm. I think that the, 
the the the, the long sermons just focused on the Bible mm. um, and the and the stripped down nature of the hymnody. I mean, I again, I love. I haven't lost my love mm. for you know Victorian hymns or you know Thomas Tallis, but there's something I came to appreciate about the just radical democratization, which snobs would call dumbing down, I suppose, yeah, but it's not, yeah. it's not of the theology that I, I think confronted me. I, and I was praying too, but radio silence from the Holy Spirit, right. by the way, like not, okay. no warm, no warm and fuzzies at okay. all. So this is so interesting because in a sense, you're, you're finding that you're being drawn towards something, which is probably the last thing you probably expected to, to be the thing that might do it for you. Um, and yet there you are. I, is it possible, and maybe you're just not the kind of person, as you say, who's going to have that typical born-again experience, but was there a point at which some line got crossed where you said, no, I think I do have to surrender to this, even if I don't feel like I've got God on speed dial or anything like that? What was that sort of process? I was, over the course of the of last summer, continually praying, you know, God, just show yourself to me. Like, mm. I, I just need, I need an, it doesn't have to be something dramatic. I just need a nudge. And I would take these concerns to JD. And he said, you know, you have to just accept God, God makes people with different temperaments. And he, he explained to me that here he is a pastor and he doesn't have a, a rich history of, you know, thunderous experiences mm. with mm. the Holy Spirit. And you just have to take what God gives you, essentially. I found that very frustrating. Mm. I would sort of listen to it and go away. <laughs> and I was continuing to do both the reading on the resurrection and also reading on cosmology and the Big Bang. Francis Collins' book, The Language of God, was really mm. significant for me. Mm. Uh, Francis Collins, too, as I learned about his autobiography, mm. was one of the few models I had encountered of someone who converted as an adult. You know, He became head of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and a, a very fancy genetic mm. scientist. Mm. But he grew up in a secular family, yeah. converted in med school. And so there, there was a, a model or two like that. Although still, as I learned about those autobiographies, they seem to have more of a robust emotional component than mm. I had. But I just kept rereading my notes and thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not 99.5% persuaded that the resurrection is the best explanation for the evidence we have. Mm -hmm. But I know I am well north of 51%. <laughs> this is a late summer of It's a very historic and historical scientific yes. way of kind of assessing the, the probabilities here. Well, here's the other thing. <laughs> I, I didn't want to convert out of cowardice. Sure. I was really... So the, the 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 sermons that would make me the maddest would be the ones full of comfort, right? Like you know, I remember uh, JD lo lost his mother shortly before Easter 2022, and, and his Easter sermon was all about the you know the comfort that mm -hmm. that Christianity offers you in the face of death, and you know how he he'll see his mother again, and you know she she's she's with Jesus and all of this, and I just made my skin. Crawl. Wow, right. I'm not I didn't want to convert for a bribe I'm only interested in in the bribe if it's attached to something true so I needed I needed the whole process to feel rigorous mm. and I I do think that that God made this path for me that is very idiosyncratic but was exactly what I needed and so by the end of last summer I got to the point where I thought if I want if I want the emotional side of it uh, and I, and as I was talking about this with Christian friends, they would say, well, you seem to be describing the experience of faith and faith is a relationship with God. Mm. And you can't, it's, it's sort of like uh, becoming friends with somebody, you know, there's a certain amount of um, investigation and intelligence you can gather about a person before you really know them, mm -hmm. you can Google them and have a first chat or whatever. But at a certain point, you can't know what they're like as a friend until you make yourself vulnerable mm. and you trust them and you, you actually take the step of entering into that relationship. And so maybe to, to get the, the sort of the feeling part mm. that I was so hungry for, this relationship with Jesus that evangelicals talk about, I had to actually, I had to actually take that step. And so, you know, I took a lot of comfort in, uh, you know, what Paul says in first Corinthians that are, um, no, sorry, Romans, Romans 10, mm. 9, uh, that, you know, if you believe with your heart that uh, Jesus um, uh, 
what is it, died for our sins mm-hmm. and, and confessed mm-hmm. with your mouth yeah. that he rose, that God yeah. raised him from the dead, yeah. and you will be saved. Um, yeah. That that that's like the core. Mm-hmm. And and that I could I could agree to sort of struggle with all the other pieces mm-hmm. and, and all the other doubts that are absolutely still persistent. And and that 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 is the core. And so I yeah, I found myself confessing that, you know, wow. in, in this in JD's office. And then and then I had to decide if I wanted to get baptized again. Right. Yes, because of course oh, you'd had to yes. had you'd been baptized in the Episcopal right. Church. And I guess Summit is a Baptist church by 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 tradition. And so would would normally, even if someone had had a uh well, no, I say that because in in terms of an infant baptism, they might rebaptize. What, what, Definitely. So, so, what was the choice in this case? Because you had sort of had a a sort of proto baptism. Yeah. When you were still. I mean, it was agnostic. a believer's baptism. But it was baptism, you know, the sprinkling. But it was a little bit kind of aspersion. Do I or don't I? <laughs> kind of. And really I at the at beginning of at the beginning of this process, I could I could kind of see where it was going. I was like, well, maybe I will actually be a Christian by the end of this, but there is no freaking way. I am getting baptized again, especially in this gauche, you know, like jacuzzi built yeah. into the stage of this mega church. When I, you know, black T-shirt with Jesus in my place on it, like that is and, not. And was it the back of your mind? Were you slightly also thinking, what on earth are all my secular academic peers going to make of this crazy journey I've just been on? Yes. <laughs> I, so I was. I mean, my my husband knew it was going on and mm-hmm. you know he was doing his best to be supportive but um struggling with it okay uh but i was not i was not talking about it mm. um you know very there, publicly no right. uh and I, I mean not as much because i didn't understand what was happening i didn't i wasn't ready to narrate it but i found that by last august when i was like okay i'm taking this step it seemed suddenly quite obvious that a crucial part of that obedience was getting baptized again. Mm. And so I, and I, let me let me add a detail too, which is another sort of nerdy historian detail. Beginning of the summer, as this was sort of ramping up, mm. I thought this is this is very intellectually intense. I I was just obsessed. I was just reading nothing but the theology and scripture. I thought this can't. This is not sustainable. And I need to deal with this the way I deal with every other intellectual project, which is I give myself a deadline. So I looked at the church calendar and I thought, well, St. Augustine's feast day is coming up at the end of the summer, August 28th. I love Augustine. Uh, so yes, that will be my deadline to get myself sorted one way or another. <laughs> You're right. This is the most historian detail. <laughs> but I, I kind of forgot about my own deadline, but God didn't forget. Oh. Because I, I found myself just saying the some of my incompetent version of the sinner's prayer in JD's office the week prior to the August 28 happened to fall on a Sunday last year. Mm. And it turned out that Summit does baptisms roughly once a month. They were mm. doing baptisms on that Sunday, on the feast day of mm. St. Augustine. I love it, too, because it's like this little high church, <laughs> you yeah, know, Anglican thing, of like Anglican on the otherwise, there. like, yeah. totally low church. <laughs> so I found myself in the unexpected position. I was, like, in the chlorinated tank, getting dunked by the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention while the worship band wow. played. Talk about plot twist. <laughs> It was it was really awesome. I mean, yeah. it was it was so much more. It was it was sacramentally really intense for me. Mm. Oh, uh, interesting! In a way that I didn't I didn't expect. Mm. I mean, it was sort of the closest I approached to the you know what I imagine is the sort of confirming yeah. warm fuzzies right. that the, the mature Christians I envy. And, have. and I'm guessing the first time round was more of a sprinkling. This was the proper in and yes. out kind of dunking. The first time was at the Great Vigil at Easter, mm. and it was in front of all my colleagues, really, mm. because that parish uh, is was the sort of parish that served my my university community. It was kind of traumatizing because I didn't know why I was doing it, and it, you know, it's really you feel very vulnerable. Mm. Um, and it, I, this was in front of hundreds of people, but they, you know, they don't they don't make you talk or anything. It's it, it had a kind of um, it was still my own experience. Mm, mm. Mm. Wow. I, because, so you've, you've had this sort of amazing journey into, um, 
into Christianity, into all of this thing. But it also really goes hand in hand with a genie into church, like an institution. And that uh, we did touch up at the beginning of the conversation, but I just want to circle back to it because I think as a historian, people might be quite surprised that, you know, you've seen you've seen the good, the bad and the ugly of what, you know, the, ch- the church, capital C, you know, institutionalized Christianity has been and done in America and in the wider world. Um, how do you, you know, I know you said you're not impressed by, you know, because you know that institutions are broken, but how do, has that been a struggle for you? Or actually has the fact that you've seen it all made it easier to sort of put your trust into a church, not just into sort of Christianity um, as a sort of an individualistic thing? It's something I have to think about a lot because yeah. there is, I mean, there's been a range, as I've been telling people in my life about this, there's a really an interesting range of reactions, but certainly some people see my decision to become a, a, a Christian in, in very political terms, and mm-hmm. they, they focus a great deal on the fact that I've, I've, I'm a member of a Southern Baptist church. Um, or, interestingly, the other objection I encounter among secular folks is, is aesthetic. Mm. Like, how can you, you know, how can you choose this institution that yes. is so mm. middle brow and and it has stripped away all the elegance and, and the history in, in their view. And we can come back to mm. how that's not entirely fair. Um, but then more pressing, right, is the, is the, is the ugly history, sure. um, you know, of white supremacy and, and uh, you know, subjugation of women and, and, mm. and these things. And here's, here's how I'm, I'm thinking about it. I mean, on the one hand, I think that there are, there are very particular reasons why I became a Christian at this church in, in this particular community. And I think, I think God had to humble mm-hmm. me in a very particular way. Uh, and, and I'm still, I'm still going and I'm, 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 I'm a member, a, a part of a Bible study because this, the, the Southern Baptists in, in this community have a, you know, if you need to get discipled on the absolute basics of Christianity, which even though I have a lot of head knowledge, mm-hmm. I, I do really at a heart level, um, it's a powerful place to be. And when you, when you join any, any church, you, are, you may be affiliated with some enormous structure, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Worldwide Catholic Church or, you know, the, the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, with its, what, something like 14 mm-hmm. million members or something like this now. I'm not sure what the current figure is. But it, in, your, in your lived experience, you are really, you're joining a particular congregation. And if it's a big congregation like mine is, you're probably joining really a particular corner of it, right? And mm-hmm. that's your experience. I will say too that my place there has given me new sympathy for the Christians I've interviewed throughout my career as a journalist, uh, who I, you know, I would be approaching because they have some particular location mm. in Christian culture. You know, they're at a particular college I'm writing about or something, and I would talk to them and have these very specific questions about their institution, their theological tradition, and often they would say, mm. "Well, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm a Christian." I don't, I mean, yes, I go to this church yeah. and there are reasons I do, but, mm. but I'm a Christian. Mm. And it sounds very obvious. I, again, at an intellectual level, I always appreciated individuals don't always yeah. agree with everything their pastor says or uh, everything the whole denomination does in every corner. Um, and, and that's not to say that I, I've kind of, I think it's appropriate for a new convert to just pick and choose, mm. right? So Christianity has been incredibly outrageous to the mainstream culture in every every cultural mm. moment of its history, you know, for 2,000 years. And that's as true today as it was in ancient Rome. So there's a lot of pieces of the doctrine and its implications that I'm still wrestling with. But I'm, I'm so focused on assimilating the basics, mm. uh, the, the resurrection and its implications. And this context is the right context for me to do that in. Yeah. Um, but but I I'm very aware of the burden yeah, yeah. of you know lifelong Christians or new converts to be constantly coming to terms with the evidence it's, for human depravity and yeah. the history of that. Mm-hmm. I I mean it's interesting sticking with the SBC the Southern Baptist Convention for a moment because um, and uh, you know I'm sure every church has its own distinctives within that denomination. But just recently at the time of recording they they had their convention and 
another mega church actually got expelled from the convention, um, uh, Rick Warren Saddleback Church, because they've chosen to uh, essentially ordain women. Um, and and that's a, and essentially in doing that, the convention were kind of confirming that they decided as a as a group of churches that that they're going to take a strong stand on on that particular issue. And for a lot of people, that you know probably a lot of your peers that that will just kind of confirm for them well you know it's everything i suspected american evangelicalism is about it's about excluding and doing you know and you know there's been a right wing turn in the sbc and everything else those are a lot of the news stories we're seeing um so again it's it's kind of a lot of people i think will will be surprised to find you know you but presumably this sort of intelligent uh, highly educated um liberal sort of arts um, professor is kind of saying actually no that's my that is I feel like that is my spiritual home right now um, so we are, are we not getting the full story here are the other headlines perhaps misleading us about exactly what what the kind of the nature is of what's going on in the SBC or, or any other denomination like it yeah I think uh, I resonate a lot with what a pastor friend of mine says on the, these questions. This is not JD, but another pastor. Mm. Uh, these questions of women in leadership, uh, you know, se sexual identity. There are so many really intelligent Christians steeped in the same tradition as he is, who disagree with with his conservative views on on this question. And it's better, therefore, to lead with what you're sure about to you know to lead with jesus mm. uh to lead with the implications for you know caring relationships toward other humans than to lead with those culture wars fights and i think the southern baptist convention is in this really complicated place where many people including including uh people at my church don't want they're not interested in leading with what we could call kind of the culture wars mm. issues However, they're they're not interested in in avoiding them either, mm. and I I'm sensitive to the way in which I am an outsider, mm. and I don't have the lived experience that so many women I'm coming to know as a new member of this church have with the way in which complementarian gender theology has absolutely been exploited to to gain power because this is what humans do. Uh, I, I understand that there's a there's a level of, of um, grappling with that and, and, and understanding it that only comes with lived experience. Mm -hmm. However, and this is this was true before I became a Christian. Uh, I I've always thought it was important to push back against what I see as cheap secular or, or liberal caricatures of conservative gender theology. I mean, there's a reason why millions of, of women they're not they're not coerced mm. into uh into into participating in churches that have this model of how men and women should relate i mean there are there are certainly poisonous toxic mm. dynamics um but if you if you persist in thinking that this is a paradigm forced on women with no agency you are blind to all the ways in which women in a church like summit you know do do actually mm. exercise quite a lot of, of really powerful leadership mm. and so i'm I, I see myself as in a position of of just learning yeah. and yes i i i know more about the history than the average new convert um but again i guess i just see it in this in this bigger picture of what humans are like and that is Humans in all places, in all times, of all races and genders and colors, if they have power, they seek to keep it and uh, grow it. And if they don't have power, they seek to gain it, and often by any means necessary. And I suppose if, if there's anything that being a, a historian of the church teaches you, it, it is that there is no perfect church to join. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, and so I'm you're, you're going to be making a compromise somewhere when, when you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm struck by the way in which. These are questions that come up uh, because I uh, uh, joined a Southern Baptist church that probably wouldn't come up if I had become mm -hmm. a Catholic, mm -hmm. even though the theology sure. on these questions yeah, no, are yeah. is the same. And I understand that because especially in the American context, there's a certain set of signals. And I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, it's so frustrating 
because that story of the culture wars is quite diff distant from my own experience of this very nerdy focus on the evidence for the resurrection. Mm. On the other hand, a major reason why I decided to speak publicly about my conversion after being uncertain about it for, for some months is because in our incredibly polarized society, I think it's valuable to send the message that the culture war boxes mm -hmm. we tend to put people in are totally insufficient for the complexity okay. of human experience. Mm. And that it is actually possible for a person to be in multiple worlds at once, and it probably happens more often than we realize. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Um, just We just don't fit into boxes as neatly as we think we do. And you always think that the person on the opposite side to you fits in their box really neatly. Even if you think, I don't fit into mine, but I know you fit into yours. And that <laughs> is just not, it's just not reality when you're in the midst of something. Um, and I think I'm so reluctant to make this our final question, but for time's sake, I should. But I think it's been so wonderful talking to you because it's just your story where like intellect and, and reason and your passions have led the way into this huge life shift for you is so interesting and I think last season we chatted to um author poet Paul Kingsnorth who ha also has a really interesting story of entering into Christianity and I think both of your stories in such different ways show that it's it's it, you can be led by the way you are and who you are in that way if you know what I mean you know it, there is no one size fits all you can explore Christianity if you're curious about it in the exact way that sort of sets you alight you know that sets your curiosity alight um and you've really like reiterated that which is so great but our our final question for you I suppose was we are the reenchanting podcast that's kind of the lens through which we want to have these conversations is how can Christianity re-enchant parts of culture, you know, that are secular, that are post-Christian in so many ways? Um, how has it? How can it? How does it? Um, so I think my final question to you, which is a biggie, but if you, you know, being a historian, but also being, you know, in the, in the academy and also being, you know, in the media world, how would you re-enchant Christianity and you've definitely touched upon a few ways already um in those in those worlds how would you do that seek to do that how can we do that I always have the instinct to turn to the richness of of history and the mm. I, I think it's important especially in conversations with younger Christians and we, we keep seeing headlines about younger Christians leaving their churches yeah. and be, getting fed up with the compromised, you know, relationship between their leadership and politics, and and all of this, uh, it's important to to turn to that two thousand year library of rich, uh, diverse but unified ways of being a Christian, mm -hmm. relating to God, relating to other people, relating to the world, uh, thinking about a Christian's job and culture, what to do in a, a post Christendom. A historical moment where in order to survive Christians have to accept that they are not they, they cannot be the moral majority they mm. are in the language of some evangelical theologians I know the a prophetic minority right mm. that doesn't look like you know Christians in ancient Rome we shouldn't get carried away with the kind of martyrdom analogies but but still there is something about the cultural location that is uh, unfamiliar in the context of recent mm. history and so it, it's exciting and empowering. I think if you uh, are a, a, a Christian who's feeling sort of fed up with your particular home in the Christian world, it's empowering to learn about Eastern Orthodox Christianity, mm -hmm. to read about Chris Christians in the global South and yeah. their, their vivid experiences with the presence of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. um, and, and the way in which you know, they explode a lot of our easy associations between or traditional Christianity and, and particular political mm -hmm. positions. Mm -hmm. And this is an especially important lesson, I think, for American evangelicals to learn. And I think that's happening more and more as, as I mean, any thinking Christian who pays attention to, you know, the trends from the mission field and, and uh, kind of demographic reality sees the center of gravity 
of Christianity. I mean, it's it's never been a West it, Western religion no. in its origins, and it yeah. certainly isn't today, no. right? I mean, most Christians do not live in the West. They're not a product of of, of white post Enlightenment secular culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in that diversity, right, that does not mean you have the freedom to to get all loosey goosey and pick and choose and treat Christianity like a smorgasbord. I think we are constantly in our modern, particularly in in the West. Uh, moment we've come to sort of, uh, we've created an idol of this very particular historically bounded idea of freedom, mm -hmm. which defines freedom as the total unencumbrance of, of any imposition on you, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's a negative idea of liberty. I think I think it's a lie. Mm -hmm. I think the the actual freedom that that humans are seeking comes from submission to a particular tradition. And finding in in the rules and in the in the narrative mm. a story of, that you can plug yourself into and make sense of your life. Mm. That's what humans are are doing, right? We are tr trying to find a way to organize our chaos. And so I think back, you know, you began by asking me about what I'm reading, and I, so I, I said I'm reading, you know, this Russian Orthodox monk and this great Puritan theologian. They seem mm. like they couldn't be more different, right? <laughs> but they they have this they have the same idea of who Jesus is. Mm. They have the same emphasis on radical human helplessness and dependence and need for grace, right? There's mm. more in common there than than not. And I guess I would I would make a very sort of old-fashioned pitch for for classic apologetics. So mm. I I get that you know, the trendy thing to do as a pastor and evangelist is to talk about Christianity as a lifestyle and how it can serve you and, and you'll just be happier. And I, I know that that, like, to some extent, humans are not rational creatures and, mm -hmm. and we do just need a, 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 an intellectual, a faith system to feel right, get all of that. But that should be a path toward the simple message of what, of what happened, right? That, mm -hmm. that the tomb was empty that the disciples saw these things, that if this guy rose from the dead, maybe we should go out on a limb and believe he is who he says he is and wrestle with the implications mm. and, and not try to sort of put it in a box because mm. it's such a scary thing to contemplate. Mm. Well, thank you for contemplating it and taking that leap of faith uh, yourself. It's, it's been such a fascinating journey mm. to hear about. And, and I hope it gives others the courage to perhaps go on a similar journey of inquiry, but it's been really, really fun talking through your journey today, Molly. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.